Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, session two in the developer community track here at AWS reInvent 2017. Uh, my name's Ian, I work in developer evangelism at AWS. I'm gonna be on stage for a minute. Just to say that this track today features uh, some of the best speakers from the AWS community around the world. Uh, we structured the content here using an open CFP, uh, which we opened up to community lead leaders, AWS, he uh, AWS community heroes, and other uh, people that had contributed substantially to the AWS global community over the course of the last year, and that's what we're showcasing in the course of this session today. So we have Ant Stanley, who is the organizer of uh, Serverless London Meetup and Jeff Conf, the founder of Jeff Conf as well, uh, someone that I've known for a long time actually. Paul Duval uh, from San Francisco and Ben Whiteley also from San Francisco. So I'm not going to do much more talking. Uh, oh, sorry. Come to the stage, please. Cool. Uh, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the session, thanks. Cool. Well, I don't need that. Cheers. Hey, everyone. Um, I kind of got the short straw here because I have to say that name. Um, so this session is about t a technological accelerance for organizational transformation. That's a shorter version of the original name. We had the word serverless in there because you have to have the word serverless and everything. Um, basically, it's, it's how technology is transforming organizations and how organizations uh, need to transform to use technology. And that's essentially the basis of this talk. Um, and that's the, probably the shortest way we could say that. Um, as, as uh, Ian mentioned, so it's myself, I run uh, Serverless London. Um, we get user group, normally get about 60 to 80 attendees um, once a month talking serverless, pretty mature serverless adoption. I uh, run GEFCOMP, which is a DevOps days style um, community serverless event in London, which we're now, there's one in Milan, there's Hamburg, and hopefully there'll be a whole lot of Je GEFCOMPs around the world. Uh, the name is changing, that's another thing. So Paul Duval, CTO from Stelligent, uh, active blogger um, in the DevOps space for a while um, and big part of this community. Uh, ben Keogh, who's actually from Boston, um, despite what Ian says. Um, uh, uh, he's a cloud, um, cloud, cloud research scientist, uh, robotics research scientist at iRobot. Um, also a uh, great blogger, lots of talks on serverless, uh, one of the leading um, sort of say, thought leaders uh, um, around serverless in the world. Um, and we're gonna basically, the structure of this talk is I'm gonna give something really high level, give you a view of how technology is, is driving a transform transformational change. Um, and then Paul and uh, Ben are gonna get a little bit more technical and give you more kind of real concrete examples of, of how this is happening. So the whole basis of my part of the talk is that there's no such thing as a new idea. Um, even the quote isn't new, Mark Twain couple hundred years old. And everything we're doing in cloud and Amazon has been done before in some other context. It's just a lot of what we're doing is taking old ideas and applying it to new new context. So we look at what's happening with, with tech, technology. There's a guy called Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, came up with this. Um, e e ephemeralization uh, in the 1930s. This concept's about 80 years old. At least he's the first person to talk about and write about it. Um, the concept's way older. But basically, it comes down to doing more and more with less and less until you can do everything with nothing, is, is the theory of the end state. And what we're seeing in technology is that everything's getting smaller. Everything we're doing around cloud is getting smaller. This ephemeralization effect is happening constantly. So a unit of deployment used to be an entire machine. You know, um, in the days of like Colossus, Edvac, ENIAC, going way back in, you'd deploy a machine, an application, all at the one time, and then operating systems were invented. Computers were around for like about 10, 15 years before an actual operating system existed. Um, uh, and then, you know, you deploy an operating system, and you deploy a virtual machine, a container, and today we, we deploy functions. That's a unit of deployment um, in your serverless platforms. Uh, the time to deploy goes down, you know. Um, ENIAC, I think, took eight years to build. Um, and it, you know, now it's going months, days, you know. Uh, if you want to uh, order a VAX machine, it'd be months to build. Um, like HP and Dell, you'd be days to get your machine. Um, and your time to deploy is, is significantly going down. Hours now with virtualization and then minutes and seconds, minutes in the Docker, minutes and seconds in Docker, and actually milliseconds if you're talking Lambda. Um, so that's a big sort of technology change. Uh, the next one, the average lifespan. This is quite important as well. These things last for a far shorter amount of time. You know, ENIAC was 10 years, lasted for 10 years. You know, um, mainframes would last for also those kind of uh, time frames. You've got commodity x86 machines, typically around a three-year lifespan. 
Um, then you go to virtualization, typically um, under three years. You know, your VM would last for a year, two years, three years. Unfortunately, some VMs, you still NT4 VMs get, sometimes last 10, 10 plus years, but that's another conversation. Um, containers and days, uh, some research came out recently and saying the average lifespan on a container um, in a um, container orchestration platform is about two and a half days. Um, and they're talking functions, they're talking seconds and milliseconds is how long they last. So the lifespan of, of the unit of compute is significantly lower. Um, frequency of deployment, so as stuff gets smaller, you start to deploy quicker. Your scope of deployment changes. So you do, you, you're going from deploying, um, taking years to deploy, you know, ENIAC, eight years, um, two minutes to deploy. Um, and you, any organization that's done a cloud transformation, you're gonna see, um, I saw a good slide the other day from the Financial Times in London, where they, they presented to their senior leadership team how long it took them to deploy. And they went from physical on-prem to Lambda, and it went from 120 days to under a day. And they did that change in about two years to take it there, and that made significant differences to their business. Um, and the other one is the scope of change. You know, how big, when you make a deployment, how big is the change? You know, um, and, the, and the days that we're going back to ENIAC, um, you change your machine, the entire, entire platform would change when you've got a new machine, you know, and then you start to do operating system upgrades, you know, you go from NT4 to Windows 2000 to 2003, and then you do major and minor version. But these days, the scope of changes commit. It's really, really small, you know. Actually, the, the Semver version patterning is actually going out of fashion because changes are happening so rapidly, you can't keep up with all the version numbers. So trend you're seeing a lot now is your, the, the git hash is now, that's your version. You know, what's, what's that version number of that, that git commit? You know, so the scope of change is tiny. So these are all trends that have been happening. You know, so what does this do to your organization? How does this affect your business? So talk about another concept. Um, this is old. It's, um, it's a Japanese uh, concept about automation with a human element. Um, the Toyota production system has two elements to it, Kanban and um, uh, automation with a human element. Kanban is, is probably the more popular one. This is the other side of it. This is probably just more important. This is really, think of this 1902 um, when Toyota were making looms. This is DevOps for looms. Um, and then later when, um, when they started making cars, they applied these processes. But it's really about an individual um, running a whole series of machines through automation. So they're controlling the automation rather than controlling the machines. And that's where we're moving to with, with the DevOps movement. We're no longer you know, manually provisioning machines, manually provisioning um, applications, we're provisioning, we are managing the tools that do that for us. But the concept is over 100 years old. Um, DevOps is not new. This is another thing that's changing. So any ITIL practitioners in here, anyone who's sat in a change advisory board? Come on, there's more than that. Okay, so the fun thing with change advisory board is you have people from different teams in there. So you wanna bring your change, you're an app developer, uh, you're a sysadmin, you want to bring your change, whatever it is, and you've got to sit in this change advisory board and get approval from all these people to make these changes. You know, but, you know, and these people sit there, and they, but what they really are is they're representatives of bigger teams. Now, each of these teams um, had their own objectives they're working towards. You know, the network team is worried about throughput performance and availability and capacity of the network. They care about the network. They don't care about your change. They don't care about the value that change might bring to the business. You know, security teams, the same thing. It's a secure, you know, um, they don't care about what impact that has on business. The storage teams, the same thing. They're all working often at cross purposes to each other. And what they're trying to do often is limit, um, limit the scope of change, limit the responsibility, and limit any potential damage. This doesn't help organizations. It makes change slow. It, it hurts your ability to respond to um, your users' needs. In the cloud world, that's gone. You have one team, your um, product team or agile DevOps team who are working towards meeting your user needs. You get rid of that, that structural um, conflict that Artil brings in. And that's one of the big changes with DevOps and it's enabled by cloud. Because if you couldn't automate all those functions, if you couldn't automate storage, you can't automate security, you can't automate that, you can't do this. There's a reason that, you know, we, we had that, is because these things were done manually. 
it was hard to, you had to have deep specialists in these areas. With cloud, you don't need those deep specialists. You need people who understand that, but what they're focusing on is the automation. So, you know, so the trend is we're seeing teams replaced by services. Your storage team is gone. It's an API now. Um, you're seeing consistent standardized interfaces, all API-driven, and it's idempotent. So it means that it's, it's behaving in a, a consistent manner, you know, so you can trust it, and trust is important in cloud. Um, so now you're getting this large array of services automated by a small team, and your focus goes away from, you know, just your little bit to taking full responsibility for the service that you're delivering back to the business instead of taking responsibility for your little item within it. So what happens with this process? This is, this is one of my favorite tweets I've seen in the last year. This is what happens when you start to replace, um, you start to move to the cloud. As this is a GitHub commit, 350,000 lines of code gone, someone's little hack replaced by two lines of code calling a third party service. Or as Corey Quinn says, you know, when AWS Cloud releases a better feature than your horrifying workaround, every single one of us has a horrifying workaround, and we've done that. Um, but as AWS matures, they've released services, and you'll be able to deprecate these workarounds. Unfortunately for a lot of vendors who, who try to fill the gaps, um, that can be a bit of trouble too. But uh, yeah, and we're going to get announcements in the next two, two, three days where stuff we built ourselves to meet a need, we can get rid of because AWS are going to announce services. We know this. They're going to announce services um, that will replace something we built ourselves, and they'll, they'll replace with something better. And we know it because they do that every year. Um, and this brings efficiency back to you, because that's something you don't have to worry about anymore. So this is another law. So this is uh, Corey Quinn's law. I think Corey's not here. So I'll, he's speaking in the next session. Um, and this is going to happen. So there's other quite famous one that gets quoted a lot. So you know, organizations, design systems, systems will look like the communication structures within an organization. Conway's law in 1968. Conway's law was derided for most of the, for about 30 years, only until MIT and Harvard did separate studies validating it. Pe people actually say, hey, this is real. But these concepts are old. Um, so if we look at the organizational structure under ARTL, You've got your specialist teams underneath. You've got a service delivery layer in the middle between the business at the top, um, providing essentially the communication and abstraction of that team below. But that service delivery layer, service delivery managers, um, your help desk, your um, uh, yeah, your help desk, uh, change managers, and all of that. What they end up doing is they provide a bottleneck, and they, that's how you get this department of no, because they're trying to deal with all the requests from all the business units. And they're trying to manage those requests back to these other teams who are all working across purposes against each other. And that's the old structure. That's what Artel tried to do, but it kind of had to do it because if you didn't have that, that layer, those teams below would get flooded and things would fall apart. With the cloud, that changes. Every team, every business unit can have a, a team working directly for them, and they have their own AWS account. You know, they have their own cloud account. They, didn't, they are separated from other teams in the business. What they do in one, one side of the business is not going to impact the other. You know, um, someone deploying an app here isn't going to take resources away from another app there. It's not going to take away you know, fiber channel capacity or storage capacity or network capacity from another business unit. There's that isolation, which then allows those business units to move faster, allows those people in those teams to meet the needs of that business unit quicker. And what happens to the IT department? The IT department doesn't disappear. Their role changes. They're no longer looking at managing specialized services. So now it comes around compliance, security, um, education. How do you enable your business to use these services? You know, and this is a trend you see with every company adopting Amazon at scale. One of the big focuses on the IT department is how do we, how do we enable this platform to work for our business, and how do we let the people within the business unit realize the value out of that? Um, and that's key to success. You know, you're getting these cloud center of excellences. They're called lots of different names, but you'll recognize them. And that's what the changing face of um, IT organizations look like now. They're closer to the business. So if you look at Conway's law for AWS. What's actually happening is your AWS organization structure now mirrors your business structure. You're getting rid of the structural conflict that happened before. Um, and AWS organization API helps enable that because you now have that better segregation of accounts 
um, and you get that better isolation between business units. So what does that look like in the end? Um, yeah, it's basically kind of this. So you're going to have AWS accounts uh, per business unit, and then individual developers have AWS accounts. And if you take your organization uh, map and you put it up against um, uh, a map of your, um, your org chart against a map of your AWS organization accounts, if they match, you can have good structural alignment and you can be able to move faster. Um, so, you know, it's new old challenges. It's a challenge we all have. So this is Alex Stamos. He's a chief security officer at Facebook. And the one biggest challenge we should, if you're working with the IT department, is how do you keep your company secure and compliant um, while allowing the culture to blossom? You know, and this is not a new challenge. It's what every, all of us should be doing. And AWS enables that. So last slide, here's two, two products that are enabling you to do that. So Barclays are talking, I think, 2.30, uh, about a new platform called Persephone, which enables this for their business, enables them to roll out AWS accounts to everyone in the organization. And they have 20,000 developers. So that is not a small feat. Um, watch it on YouTube, because you want to be here for the next session. Um, and then Cli Capital One uh, released a product about a year and a half ago, Cloud Custodian, predating it, that enables it. So the technology is there that enables all of that. So I'm going to hand over to Paul now. Um, and he's going to, kind of a bit, going to go deeper into what this actually looks like and you know, how you'd actually do this at a more technical level. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Thanks a lot, Ant. So um, I'm actually from Northern Virginia, by the way. Uh, I like to refer to as US East One, pretty close to there. Um, and so as Ant mentioned, I'm going to be going over some specific examples around organizational transformation utilizing technology. And just a little bit about myself. Uh, my background is in software development. Uh, really from the very beginning, I've been interested in the end-to-end -end life cycle. So not just the application development, but build, deploy, security, databases, everything it takes to put a software system together. Uh, probably what you would refer, refer to as a full stack developer today, but yeah, way in the old back days. Um, and I was often really frustrated by the time it would take to deploy and release software changes to users. And as a result of that, I got interested in practices like uh, daily builds and integrating more frequently, which led me to write a book on continuous integration that came out in 2007. Around the same time, I also co-founded a company called Stelligent. And Stelligent's focus is and always has been on helping customers release software uh, changes to users whenever they choose to do so. We, we started working with AWS in 2009 and really never looked back um, and was recognized as an AWS community hero uh, last year really is a reflection of one of our core values, and that is of sharing. So sharing through talks like these, um, through, uh, if you look at our blog, you can see a lot of technical, uh, detailed solutions where you can launch a solution in your own AWS account. Um, and then open source projects. And so I'll be sharing some of those open source projects as part of the solutions I'll be going over today. So I want to talk about DevOps in terms of feedback. And if you look at a typical software development life cycle, on the one side, you have customers. On the other, you have developers. And so a developer might come up with a new idea for a feature. They're going to implement it, build it, test it, put it through a release process until it gets delivered to production where your customers can actually start to use it. And it's only once it gets in the hands of your customers are you able to start to learn from it. So you might be able to look at customer usage data or speak directly to customers and, and make some decisions on what you want to work on next. And that's when this whole feedback loop starts again. And so a couple things to consider. One is from, um, from the perspective of your customers, uh, you're only able to be as, um, re you're only able to speed, uh, speed up through the, those feedback loops um, based on how responsive you are to customers and how innovative you are in terms of getting through those loops. And then ultimately, from your customer's perspective, you're only delivering value when you're spending time on the left side uh, developing new features rather than building, testing, putting through a release process. And so you want to spend more time, maximize your time on the left side, and minimize the time uh, that you're spending in the middle walking through those changes. And that's ultimately what DevOps is all about, is any kind of efficiency 
that you can drive into the process in order to increase those feedback loops uh, is DevOps. And so that could be an organizational change, could be cultural change, process change, tooling change, any of these uh, make up DevOps. And that's what I'll be showing today through four specific examples. One is an organizational change, and that is breaking down silos. The, the second and the third uh, examples are making work visible and identifying process bottlenecks, which more of the process changes. And the last one I'll go over is more of a cultural change of finding and fixing defects as quickly as possible. You can jot this uh, URL down right now. It's stelgen.com dvc 303. I'll show that one more time. But it's going to have links to a lot of the resources, these open source projects, blog posts, and other uh, references to what I'll be going over today. So let's talk about the first problem. So how do you break down silos? So this is being an organizational change. If you look at how traditional organizations are put together, they're more project oriented. Um, and so you might have a project based team that you see on the left. And that project based team is responsible for primarily building the software. They might be doing some testing. But when they want to get to the point of deploying and releasing features out to users, they need to interface with different teams within, uh, within an organization. And these functions, these teams might be called something different in your organization, but we're talking about things like release management, change advisory boards, and DBAs, and security teams. And um, when you're interfacing with these teams, you're often introduced to gates in this process. And what do these gates often look like? They look like um, really long email threads. They look like issue tickets, tracking system. They look like meetings. They look like uh, requests for architecture diagrams, things like that. And all that slows down that process. And it, it slows down, going back to that feedback loop, it slows down the, the ability to deploy and release features out to users. And as Ant talked about with Conway's Law, you look at the organization here, you have a large organization that's responsible for deploying and releasing software features to users. And that ultimately uh, resembles the overall architecture that you're going to be delivering. The other point is, because it takes so long, these teams spend a lot of time uh, creating large batches um, and, de and delivering those large batches, which means it might take on the order of months or in some cases years uh, to deploy uh, changes out to users. So uh, as going back to this, as Edwards Deming once mentioned, a bad system is going to beat a good person every single time. So one of those solutions is organizing around API-enabled services. So instead of project-oriented teams, you have more product-oriented teams. And these product-oriented teams consist of every one it takes to put the, the software service together. So you can have application developers, infrastructure, tests, QA. And these are these small two-pizza teams, which you may have heard of from time to time, that Amazon uh, talks about it quite a bit. And instead of those gates where you have the emails and issue tracking, in terms of the fine-grained communication when it comes to deploying and releasing features, that's going through an API. And so you're interfacing, you're consuming the services of, say, a security team through an API to get static analysis, dynamic analysis, um, and other features um, of, of that team. You might have a tooling team. You might have spend management. You might have uh, backups, monitoring, those types of services. The other key thing is each of these teams, being product teams, they own the end-to-end -end life cycle. And so it's not just building the software, but it's building, testing, deploying, running, and supporting that system. They own that end-to-end -end life cycle. And then each of the teams that support these product-oriented teams, they also own the end-to-end -end life cycle. So they're still centralized teams oftentimes, but these individual teams that are external customer-facing they're delivering features to their customers. These other teams are, de are delivering features to their customers who happen to be internal, but they're all still product-oriented teams. And so as Ant talked about, everything's getting smaller and smaller, and you have more control over the features that you are able to deliver. And so this is one example. Um, this is based on something AWS provided, in which you're providing an API. In this case, we're using Amazon API Gateway. 
And that's calling a Lambda function, which it could be anything. It could be a, you know, a container-based service or EC2 or whatever. But you have a Lambda function, calls out to CloudFormation template, which then launches CloudFormation SACs. And so from the developers, the consumer's perspective, all they need to know is that they're consuming an API. Uh, they don't need to know to go into the AWS console and click through you know, various uh, uh, different means to, to consume that service. And you're able to really control how that service is consumed. And so we have a reference within our GitHub organization. But like I said, you can just reference that one link that I showed before. So second problem I want to talk about is how do you make work more visible uh, within an organization? And oftentimes what we find in organizations is uh, they're making decisions either based on no data, ineffective data, out of date information. So ultimately they're making guesses. And so one solution, uh, technical solution for this, is to utilize something like Amazon CloudWatch dashboard. And so this is a solution where we're using uh, continuous, uh, a continuous delivery system, and we're able to get in real time the latest information, such as what does it take uh, to, for the lead time, the cycle time, the mean time to recovery. And the architecture looks like this. So you have code pipeline events, code pipeline being a continuous delivery orchestration service. It's generating these events, and then you have a cloud watch event rule, which targets a Lambda function. That Lambda function then generates those metrics I went over before. And then it pushes that information to a CloudWatch uh, dashboard. And then in order to keep it so that's real time, uh, we have a scheduled Lambda function that wakes up every so often and then generates those, uh, those metrics in the CloudWatch dashboard. So what you're ultimately able to do with this is you're able to, um, we provided this to the community as well. It's an open source project uh, called Pipeline Dashboard. And you can launch a CloudFormation stack in a couple different regions in your own AWS account um, and look at your code pipeline uh, metrics and be able to align what you're doing uh, for each of your deployment pipelines, each of your, each of your delivery processes, to uh, what your overall strategy in, when it comes to deploying more frequently and more uh, quickly. So the third problem I want to talk about is how do you identify process bottlenecks? And this is a, another thing within organizations that we find is uh, some organizations look at just a particular part um, of the software uh, value stream. And so, for example, what we will find is we'll have organizations that may, may be an operations team, for example, and they get really excited about things like DevOps and continuous delivery and continuous integration. And what they'll do is maybe focus on something like infrastructure as code without looking at the full process it takes to go from a request or even a commit all the way out to production. And so this is an illustration of what's known as a value stream map. And if you look at the value stream map, there's two rows that are key there. One is value and one is waste. And in this particular example, the actual time that was spent on value creation activities is two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, whereas the waste time is six weeks, over six weeks. And so someone makes a request, and six weeks later, they get the, uh, the results, the, the benefit of, of, of that particular request. So what's really important is to look at um, all the teams that are associated. When I was talking about those functional silos, is looking at all the teams that are associated with that end-to-end -end process, have a conversation with them, and figure out where these weights, these cues that are getting introduced into the process. And so when it comes to technology, what's one way of, of solving this? Well, one is you can create um, uh, architecture diagrams, like using some kind of uh, illustration uh, type of tool. Well, for me, I'm not so good at, uh, I love looking at the architecture diagrams, but in terms of creating them, not so much. The other thing is, is once you create that diagram, it often becomes quickly outdated. So one of the solutions is actually creating a value stream map using AWS Code Pipeline. And so you can actually codify all this in code. And so you can look at all the steps that are associated uh, with the process and look at areas in which you have manual activities or you have approvals. And then automatically, Code Pipeline gives you the end-to-end -end cycle time associated with going from the commit to the production. What's more is then you can use this as your current as-is state and then 
start to incrementally improve on that via code. And so all the, this is an illustration of a uh, cloud formation architecture diagram. You can see the resources that are generated as a part of this. Um, and then you can, you can take this and then build upon those improvements. And you can, you can see that it might be, say, sitting in the, with a security team for four days. So it really doesn't matter if you spend a bunch of time on it, uh, automating your, or uh, performing infrastructure as code if it sits in a queue downstream and, and sits there for four days. So you really need to look at that end-to-end -end life cycle. And so we provided this to the community. You can go to our GitHub organization. It's called Mock Pipeline. You can mock the pipeline, but you can use, as I mentioned, you can use it as a starting point as well. And it's built on top of a, another open source tool we've developed called um, Mu, which is a DevOps on AWS full lifecycle framework um, that allows you to spin up uh, environments and services and pipelines. And so we use that as a basis for this. So the last problem I want to talk about um, is how do you fix problems earlier in the process? And I, I think we all know that earlier you find the problem or earlier you fix the problem, the less costly and less amount of time. If it's in a broken state, no one can get the, uh, the latest changes and make fixes um, because they're just they're making fixes to an already broken system. So it's really important to identify those problems early. And so one way of doing this is uh, a pattern known as uh, stop the line. Ant talked about uh, Judoka. Um, and the idea where if you use an andon cord and you stop the line you, and you say, any error that comes in our system, we're going to swarm on that error and make it the highest priority to fix it. In this example, we have a couple of stages and some actions, and we're using this open source tool called CFN NAG, which is um, a static analysis tool that analyzes your uh, CloudFormation templates and looks for any security vulnerabilities prior to even launching the CloudFormation stack. And so we can identify that problem, put it into uh, CoPipeline. But what's more is we can also uh, notify through various means. And this is part of a recent release that uh, uh, AWS CoPipeline had with CloudWatch events, where you can uh, trigger a Lambda function, you can um, send SNS notifications, you can update the dashboard, things like that. And so we've also provided this uh, to the community as well. Uh, it's a full end-to-end -end example that you can take and then customize uh, on your own. So in summary, uh, you can, again, go to that, um, that URL that you see up there. But we talked about breaking down silos. Um, that's organizational change and, and utilizing uh, the ability to organize around API-enabled services. Uh, the second one is in making work more visible uh, using Amazon CloudWatch dashboard and integrated with uh, other types of AWS services. Uh, the third one we talked about is identifying process bottlenecks and looking for the as-is value stream map and then in, um, incrementally improving it. And then the last one we talked about is uh, fixing problems earlier in the process um, so we can um, make them less costly, less um, complex to fix. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Kehoe from iRobot. He's going to be talking about lessons learned there. Hi, so I'm Ben Kehoe. Um, I'm a cloud robotics research scientist at iRobot, a serverless evangelist. I uh, have strong opinions about that. And I'm an AWS community hero. Um, and all of this uh, means that I exist like several places on the Gartner hype cycle. Um, but the point is that what I do, and uh, one of the things we do at iRobot is cloud robotics. And that's about connecting robots to the internet to help them do more and better things. And so um, our story of becoming serverless started in 2015 when we launched the, our first cloud-connected Roomba, the Roomba 980. And uh, so we have a long history of building robots. Um, we go back 25 years. We've built underwater robots. We've built space robots. We've built oil well robots. We've built some really creepy dolls at one point. Uh, <laughs> And we've built you know, networked robots. We've had defense robots that have done you know, even uh, mesh networking and things, so very complicated networking scenarios. We had a telepresence business that uh, was cloud connected, but it was you know, aimed at the enterprise. It was single tenant, private cloud, um, and the scale was not very large. So um, you know, when we started, 
we didn't have a history of building scalable elastic cloud applications. And now, um, in 2017, you know, our full line of Roombas is connected. Um, we also have our hard floor care robot, uh, the Brava Jet, is Bluetooth connected as well. So we're sort of well into that space. And in the future, uh, you know, we have uh, smart home integrations like Alexa and Ift. You can control your Roomba uh, through custom actions through that. Uh, and we see that as Roombas build uh, maps of the home, uh, they can get an understanding of your space to allow that smart home to perform uh, better for you, right? And so that's where we're going. And then in 2015, we launched, and we were on a, uh, a full solution cloud provider uh, that we had chosen some years previous for reasons that were mostly valid at the time. Uh, but even before launch, it had become clear that that provider didn't have the, the scale or the extensibility that we needed. Uh, and Alexa integration would have been very tough with them. So while we launched with them, we knew that we were going to change. And so 2016 was spent uh, figuring out who we were switching to and then building it. And one of the things we decided was that we're going to do this serverless, right? Lambda had launched, um, and it's a really natural fit. It's you know, chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, they're both event-driven. You have sensors, you have user input, you have third-party integrations. Alexa telling you, hey, somebody uh, just ask me a question. Uh, you can say, uh, you can ask your Roomba to give the cat a ride. That's one of the Alexa uh, commands. Um, it's scalable, right? We, smell, we sell millions of uh, robots a year, and so we knew that you know, we were going to have to scale this up very rapidly. And it's also lean for device makers, and this was really important for us, right? We didn't have you know, a large cloud team with a lot of experience in operating these, these platforms um, or building these applications. We had that experience that I talked about. Um, and so serverless was going to enable us to do that without having to go through the pain of getting organizational experience in all those pieces. And uh, the reverse is kind of true now for with Greengrass, that you can take a, uh, a cloud company that has knowledge of that but not of devices and move them down onto the devices uh, using cloud programming models. So this is all about focus, right? We're delivering our value and we're not uh, learning all of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that would be involved if we were trying to do everything. So we selected AWS IoT as our uh, connection layer, um, which is a couple of pieces. Uh, AWS IoT provides a device gateway that gives you a TLS connection from your robots with bi-directional communication over MQTT. There are many sessions here at reInvent that you can go to learn about AWS IoT has rules that integrate well with the rest of uh, AWS. And it itself is, is serverless. There are no knobs to tweak. It scales to, uh, to your devices. Um, it's all event driven, right? It's a pub sub model. And uh, so you can listen for messages and uh, put rules on those, filter out messages, send them into Lambda functions, put them on Kinesis, store them in Elasticsearch, et cetera. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to do uh, asynchronous communication. It also importantly integrates with your process. So we had devices in the field that we had to you know, perform firmware updates on and get new identities for them that they could communicate uh, with, the, um, with the AWS cloud. And long story short there was that this was a success, right? We we're running a fully serverless production cloud for about a year. Um, we're projected to have two million connected robots by 2018. Um, and our analytics platform behind that, mostly serverless, you know, we still have some Spark jobs and things, but with stuff like Athena, that's getting better for us. So this pro provides the future for a data-powered platform for us. So now, the lessons that we learned from that is that, right, um, the cloud has weather, right? When there are incidents, um, you know, there's a lot of small things that come up. The big ones are the ones that get headlines, but there are things that you'll experience that, that are below that. And setting expectations internally is really important for bringing serverless uh, into your organization. Architecting robustly is key as well, um, but the biggest thing that you're gonna learn and the biggest thing that um, you need to take into account when you're making your organization lean and faster using serverless is that visibility into what your system is goes way down. Because you only know 
uh, what the platform you know, team is telling you about, about that, about their architecture, about their security, about their operations. We don't really know all the stuff uh, and all the ways that AWS does the stuff that they do. Um, there are a lot of things that we know that we don't know about that. There are a lot of things we don't know we don't know about that. The only thing that really keeps us up at night is the unknown, unknown, unknowns. <laughs> uh, because those are the things that will really, really bite you. And so to talk again about, about Conway's Law that you heard about earlier, this is Conway's Game of Life over on the, on the left here, uh, which is a different Conway, but uh, I didn't have a picture of Mel Conway. Um, you want to sort of, as, as Ant said, you want to turn this around to that normally it's talked about as that your architecture is going to reflect your organization. And when you're going serverless, you have to think about the fact that your architecture is going to change. And that's what you want. You want to change your architecture. And if you don't change your organization, you're not going to be successful because Conway's law says that that's just not going to work. So you have to think about how do things work differently when I'm serverless? And then change your organization to match those. So one of the important things here is that uh, sort of the DevOps piece of this changes a little bit. So your environments, you know, which have often been different between your development and production, when you're serverless and you're just using a managed service for something, AWS doesn't know or care whether it's your development or production environment. It works the same way, right? Um, and so uh, for that, you have the identical environments, but you're exercising them much more in your development because you're changing things all the time. You're exercising those APIs. And so this will run you into your account limits often much more, especially in the control plane part of the APIs, um, which is useful to know. You don't want that to happen in production. You'd rather have that in development. Um, you can test metrics, right? All of those things that you want to see out of, out of your production thing, you can start to see and test them out against your development environments while developers are just taking care of their process as they do. The other thing is that you can also monitor for sort of platform-wide uh, issues through your development environments. Because they're exercising those APIs more, you're more likely to run into something uh, there, which means it can tell you if you're paying attention closely enough before you're hitting production. And while that's an important piece, there's um, you know, early on in the serverless uh, conversation, people were talking about it as no ops. Like, oh, everything just goes away. You don't have to do anything. And that's very much not true. Nobody really says that anymore because all of the people who said it very quickly learned that it's not the case. And the way that I uh, phrase this is that it's a little bit like when you're moving from on-prem to cloud, right? It gets easier. Like, nobody says, oh, it's a, it's a, well, there are people who say it's a terrible idea, but those people are wrong. <laughs> uh, and they're probably not here, so I can say whatever I want about them. But there are things that get less easy, right? They get harder when you move into the cloud. And there are new things that come up that you don't have when you're on-prem. And the same thing is true when you move from servers to serverless. So it's easier overall in most respects, but there are new challenges. It doesn't mean you're doing zero work. And in your organization, you need to be clear about this, that there are going to be things that are outside of your control that, uh, you know, when there's an incident, you're waiting on uh, your provider to remediate that, right, or the service to, to come back online. And you feel out of control, and internally, your organization is going to be, uh, there's going to be stress around that because you can always say, oh, well, if we built this ourselves and ran it, we would be able to fix the problem. And while that's true, you would probably have problems more often, and the problems would be bigger, and the remediation time would be longer. So you gotta keep uh, everyone focused on the total cost of ownership, right? Because not only is, okay, so even if your performance would be better, you then have to hire more people and have larger teams to, uh, to operate and, and develop those systems, which means you're gonna run into more of the organizational issues that Ant and uh, Paul talked about in terms of inter-team cooperation. So uh, with that, I think we're uh, about out of time to move into our uh, questions segment. 
Um, Paul, did you want to wrap up? Is this, no? Okay, um, so the point is that everything's getting smaller, um, right? This is what Ant Stanley talked about. Um, DevOps and serverless can uh, help you uh, both improve your organizational transformation, but also provide you with ways uh, to, to move faster. And uh, we've got examples, and uh, it's important to become part of, I didn't write this summary. I didn't realize that I was going to be talking about it. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, now uh, Paul and Ant are gonna come back up and we're gonna take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.